Chapter 1. The normal state of mind of most humans contains a strong element called dysfunction. The normal state of mind of most human beings embodies a strong component of dysfunction or even madness. Specific teachings at the center of Hinduism probably come closest to discern this dysfunction as a pattern of collective mental illness. One of the greatest Indian scholars known as Ramana Maharshi once said, The mind is maya. The Hindu word maya means the veil of delusion, a form of mental illness that affects everyone collectively. So what we believe is our normal state of mind isn't actually normal at all. The vast majority of us are operating in a dysfunctional, egoic state rather than an enlightened state of mind. The extraordinary success of humanity is not its works of science, technology, or art, but the understanding of its own dysfunction, its own insanity. Despite our advancements in science and technology, we are still plagued by a destructive force. It's as if there is a part of us that simply wants to do terrible things. In fact, modern arts, science, and technology have intensified the violent effect that the dysfunction of the human mind has on other life forms and upon the planet in general. This is the reason why the narrative of the 20th century is where that dysfunction is most clearly observed. Over the course of history, there have been widespread circumstances where humans inflicted torture, hatred, and extensive violence on each other for ideological and religious reasons. Unfortunately, this dysfunction and the havoc it wreaks keeps accelerating and intensifying. To recognize one's own insanity is, of course, the arising of sanity, the beginning of healing and transcendence, Eckhart Tolle. So what is the solution to this fundamental problem of human nature? How do we transcend from a collective dysfunctional state of mind dominated by the ego into an enlightened consciousness? Read on to find out. Chapter 2. Ego, the Current State of Humanity The word I encompasses the biggest error and the deepest truth, depending on how you use it. In traditional usage, it is one of the most often used words in language, but also one of the most misleading. In ordinary, everyday usage, I encompasses the immature error a misperception of who you really are, and a false sense of individuality, that is the ego. This false sense of self is what Albert Einstein, who had profound understandings of human nature and also the reality of space and time, referred to as an optical illusion of consciousness. That illusory self then comes to the footing for all further interpretations or misinterpretations of reality, relationships, interactions, and all thought processes. With ego, reality becomes a reflection of the original illusion. The thing is, if you can't discern illusion as just an illusion, it fades. The discerning of illusion is also its termination. The power it holds depends on you confusing it for reality. In seeing who you are not, the reality of who you are appears by itself. This is what transpires as you carefully and slowly read this and the next chapter, which is on the mechanics of the false self we call the ego. One of the most fundamental mind structures in which the ego comes into being is identification. The word Identification originated from the Latin word idem, which means same, and facere, meaning to make. So when I identify with anything, I make it the same. The same as what? The same as I. I empower it with a perception of self, and so it fits the part of my identity. One of the most fundamental levels of identification is with things. My toy later becomes my house, my car, my clothes, and so on. I tried to discover myself in things but was never able to, and I ended up losing myself in them. 
That is the doom of the ego. Chapter 3. Role-Playing. The Many Faces of the Ego. Some egos, if they don't get admiration or praise, will resolve to other kinds of attention and play roles to bring about them. If they don't perceive positive attention, they may pursue negative attention, rather, for instance, by inciting a negative response in somebody else. Some children do that already. They misbehave to get attention. The acting of negative roles comes to be very pronounced whenever the ego is heightened by an active pain body. This implies emotional suffering from the past that wants to revive itself through feeling more pain. Some egos look for attention through fame and other people's rebuke. Please tell me that I exist, that I'm not insignificant, they appear to say. Such forms of ego are more severe versions of normal egos. A very popular role the ego plays is the victim. The kind of attention the ego strives for is pity, sympathy, or others' interest in their problems, me and my story. Perceiving oneself as a victim is a component in various egoic patterns, which include being outraged, offended, complaining, and so on. If you are aware enough, awake enough, to be able to examine how you relate with various people, you may perceive slight changes in your attitude, behavior, and speech depending on the individual you are conversing with. How you will talk to the CEO of the firm may be different in slight ways from how you talk to the manager. How you talk to a child may be distinct from how you talk to an adult. Why is that? You are role-playing and not yourself, neither with the CEO nor with the manager or the child. When you go into a store to purchase anything, or when you walk to a bank, restaurant, and the post office, you may find yourself falling into pre-established social roles. A span of conditioned shapes of behavior come into play between two human beings that specify the nature of their interaction. The more people identify with their respective roles, the more bogus the relationships become. Give up defining yourself to yourself or to others. You won't die, you will come to life. Eckhart Tolle Did you know? Nothing strengthens the ego more than being right. And for you to be right, someone else has to be wrong. This is why the ego loves to make others wrong in order to be right. Chapter 4. The Pain Body, an energy form that lives within most human beings. The pain body is a semi-dominant form of energy that dwells within most human beings, an element made up of emotions. It possesses its own basic intelligence like a trickery animal, and its intellect is aimed primarily at survival. Like all forms of life, it needs to be fed. Take in new energy, and the energy it needs to restore itself must be compatible with its own. That is to say, the energy that vibrates at the same frequency. The pain body can make use of any form of emotionally painful experience as food, and that's why it flourishes on negative thinking and drama in relationships. The pain body is an addiction to suffering. The pain body is a kind of life form within most humans that feeds off emotional pain. It may be surprising when you recognize for the first time that there is a thing within you that sometimes craves unhappiness, suffering, and emotional negativity. In fact, you need to be more discerning to recognize it in yourself than to see it in other people. When unhappiness overpowers you, you do not want an end to it, and you go even further to make others just as unhappy as you, only to feed on their negative emotional responses. For most people, the pain body has both an inactive and an active stage. 
When it is inactive, you effortlessly forget that you hold within you a dormant volcano. How long the pain body remains inactive differs from one person to the other. It might take a few weeks, days, or even months. In unusual cases, the pain body can stay dormant for years before it gets activated by some event. The pain body wakes up from its inactivity when it is time to feed and replenish itself. However, it may get accelerated by certain events at any time. The pain body that is prepared to feed can use the most trivial event as a trigger, be it what someone does or says or even a thought. If it wants to feed when you're alone, it feeds on your thoughts and, unexpectedly, your thinking becomes negative. Too much consumption of alcohol can also activate the pain body, especially in men. When a person becomes drunk, they undergo a total personality change as the pain body seizes them. A person who is deeply oblivious and whose pain body mostly recharges itself via physical violence often directs it toward other people, including their spouse and children. Chapter 5. The realization that you have a pain body will help you regain your freedom. The onset of freedom from the pain body firstly depends on realizing that you have one. Then, your ability to stay positive in the present comes next. You have to be cautious enough to note the pain body within yourself as a massive inflow of negative emotions. When it is perceived, the pain body can no longer pass to be you and dwell and replenish itself through you. The pain body cannot tolerate the light of presence. It needs your unconsciousness to thrive. The identification of the pain body is broken by your conscious presence. When you no longer identify with the pain body, it can't influence your thinking and so cannot replenish itself anymore by feeding on your emotions. In most cases, the pain body does not crumble immediately, but once you have detached the link between it and your thoughts, the pain body starts to die off. Your thinking becomes clearer, and your current awareness is no longer clouded by the past. The energy trapped in the pain body then switches frequency and is transferred into presence. Through this, the pain body becomes energy for awareness. This is the reason many of the most enlightened and wisest individuals on our planet once had a massive pain body. Become conscious of being conscious, Eckhart Tolle. The question people do ask is, how soon do I free myself of the pain body? It hinges on both the eagerness or extent of that person's ensuing presence and weight of a person's pain body. It is not the pain body, but the identification with the pain body that causes the pain that you impose on yourself and others. It is not the pain body, but identification with it that compels you to experience the past over again, keeping you in a state of oblivion. Now, the important question you should ask is, how long will it take me to be free from identifying with the pain body? Well, it takes no time at all. As soon as the pain body is prompted, have it at the back of your mind that what you are feeling is the pain body within you. This realization is all you need to sever your identification with it. And once the identification with it stops, the transmutation commences. The realization prevents the former emotions from emerging in your head and controlling your internal dialogue, your actions as and interactions with other people. Chapter 6. How to Find Out Who You Are What you recognize as what matters to you and your needs in life is determined by the sense of who you are. Consequently, whatever matters to you will have the capacity to disturb and upset you. You can use this as a standard to discover how truly you know yourself. 
What you believe or say is not necessarily what matters to you, but your actions, reactions, and inactions indicate what is significant and serious to you. Then the question of what disturbs and upsets you comes in. If minor things have the power to upset you, then who exactly do you think you are? Small. That will be your oblivious assumption. But what are small things? Ultimately, all things are small things because all things are temporary. You may say, I understand I am an eternal spirit, or I am exhausted of this insane world and peace is all I desire, until you find yourself in the midst of unexpected life events such as job loss, divorce, or the death of a loved one. Suddenly, there is an increase in anxiety and anger. A sharpness appears in your voice. I can't put up with this anymore. You blame, accuse, defend, justify, or attack yourself, and it's all occurring on autopilot. Defining yourself through thoughts means you are limiting yourself. If you desire peace, then you will choose peace. If peace means more to you than anything else, you will stay non-reactive and completely active when met with difficult situations or people. You would instantly acknowledge the circumstance and hence be one with it, other than free yourself from it. Then in your vigilance, you would come up with an answer. Who you are, your consciousness, not who you think you are, the small you, would be reacting. It would be effective and powerful and would create no situation or person into an enemy. Who you believe you are also influences how you perceive yourself being treated by others. The basic illusion of who you are can create dysfunction in all your relationships. If you believe you have nothing to offer and that the world is against you, withholding you from what you need, then your reality will be based on that. The false sense of who you are complicates situations and damages all relationships. Conclusion. The ego is on the lookout against any sort of discerned minimization. The automatic ego repair mechanisms come to play to redeem the mental form of me. When somebody accuses or chastises me, the ego sees it as a minimization of self. And whenever the ego feels minimized, it will do everything possible to rebuild its reduced sense of self through defense, blaming, or self-justification. Whether the other individual is wrong or right is insignificant to the ego. It is much more involved in self-preservation than in the facts. This is the conversion of the psychological form of me. The key to awakening to your true self is to become aware of the unwakened you, the ego in its thoughts, actions, and words, as well as to recognize the collectively conditioned mental processes that sustain the unawakened state. Once you are aware of the ego, you can then become free of it because ego and awareness are incompatible. Awareness is the power of the present moment, and the main reason why we are here, the main purpose of our existence, is to bring that power to this world. This is why breaking free of the ego cannot be made into a goal to be achieved in the future. The only antidote to the ego is to be present, and you can only be present now, not yesterday, not tomorrow. So by cultivating your awareness and by living fully in the here and now, you can undo the past in you and therefore transform your state of consciousness. Try this. Live in the present moment. Don't dwell on the past and don't let the ego control you and make you worry endlessly about things beyond your control. This is vital to releasing the pain body because when you are mindful only of the present moment, your awareness moves to a higher and more enlightened perspective. Remember, when the pain body has no old emotional pain to feed on, it stands no chance.